uh, Thomas Palokanen, who is the head of pediatric orthopedics at uh, Christian Medical College, Velour, to introduce Professor and uh, the topic also. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, as you know, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Vince Mosbach from Washington, Seattle. He is now retired, but still is active in, in those parts, still working in the clinics. Uh, he did his residency at Duke University in North Carolina, and then went and did a fellowship at the Hospital for Sick Children Toronto, when long before I did, when Salter and Mercer Rang and other luminaries were very much active. He's also on the editorial board for the JPOA and the JCO, and he's listed in a lot of international who's who directory that the best doctors in America for the last 15, 20 years. And he's written a very good tribute and about his mentor, Lynn Staheli. I don't know how many of you read that tribute in JPO last year, very touching tribute about his mentor, Lynn Staheli. All of us have read that book and the work that uh, Staheli did with Global Health. Also his connection with Sir Paul Brandt, the pioneering hand surgeon from Vellore who did a lot of work on tendon transfers in Hansen's disease and also in Nielsen Sage Foot, who I also interacted and taught um, Professor Vince about uh, total contact fasting. Um, also, I had the opportunity to share the dais with him. Uh, um, Yeah, so I, I also had the opportunity to share the dais with him in one of the teaching sessions previously. And I'm sure all of you are in for a bonanza because he's a fantastic teacher and I learned a lot with an interaction with him, sharing the dais and teaching uh, other, other students about the nuances of foot and ankle and, and pediatric orthopedics. So the topic he's going to talk about is uh, pathoanatomy and biomechanics of the pediatric foot. Uh, so over to you, Vince, and I'm, I'm sure that you will keep us all enthralled with your knowledge on pediatric set, or pediatric set and deformity in biomechanics. And if you have any questions, please put them on the on the chat box. Dr. Biren and I will take them in this time. We can ask, ask uh -huh. about those questions later on. Over Thank you, Thomas. You. Thank you, Thomas, and uh, and thank you, Dieran, for in inviting me. Uh, nice picture of us together, Thomas. <laughs> um, I have uh, two talks that I'm going to give back to back. They're on the most important aspect of pediatric foot understanding. Uh, so instead of giving talks about club foot or cavus foot or skew foot, all the name deformities, I've always felt that it's most important to understand the foot. <clears throat> By understanding the child's foot, how to how it works, how it doesn't work, how to evaluate it, and then how to manage it, those are the important understandings before you get to actually treating the foot deformity. So this first talk will be I'm going to move this off to the side. So the first talk will be on the biomechanics. And then in the second half, I'll talk about the assessment and management principles. So that's way before we get to actually treating the deformity. As I speak, I'll talk about different foot deformities, just trying to relate the basics to the actual application. But as I said, one should really not treat foot deformities in children until one understands the child's foot. Let me get that there. Whoops, went the wrong way. Let me go back. Now I lost my screen. Do you see my screen? Not yet. Uh, share screen. There we go. There we go. Okay. So, yes, yeah. Now we, we can see. Good. So I have no relevant disclosures. I'm not sure it's important for this venue, but I, I have no relevant disclosures. 
we need to start with the real, real basic biomechanics principle that the foot is not a joint. People talk about the hip, two bones, the knee, two bones, the elbow, yeah, three bones. But the foot is 26 bones <clears throat> and countless joints. So the foot doesn't just have a flexion contracture like at the knee or an abduction contracture like the hip, but the foot has so many moving parts, both congenital and developmental deformities have multiple deformities within those 26 bones. Importantly, <clears throat> most named deformities like club foot, like skew foot, like vertical talus have at least two deformities from the toe to the heel. And those two deformities are typically rotational deformities. I use this analogy of taking a towel that's wet with water, and you want to get the water out of the towel, so you twist it, and you twist it to get the water out. <clears throat> and your hands go in opposite directions. And that analogy represents what's happening in a foot. You can wring the towel out, and have one hand go in one direction, like pronating the forefoot, and have your other hand go in the opposite direction, like inverting the hind foot, and twisting out this foot to get the water out <clears throat> creates pronation of the forefoot and inversion of the hind foot, which is the cable bearer's foot deformity. Now, the importance there, <clears throat> excuse me, is that understanding that if one's going to operate on a cable bearer's foot, it would only make sense that you need to think you can't perform just one procedure and correct two opposite direction deformities. There are two deformities. So if you correct one, you need to also correct the other. And I think most people have appreciated this for many, many years. What people have not so much appreciated is that a flat foot is opposite. Here, ring out the towel, ring out the foot, you supinate the forefoot and evert the hind foot and you create a flat foot. People are very aware that in a flat foot, there's valgus eversion of the hind foot. That's easy to see. But the forefoot is supinated. And I'm going to discuss that more in the, in the upcoming slides here. People have not, talk, have not talked about that for many, many, many years until, frankly, I brought that to people's attention. It's opposite to a cable bearer's foot two rotationally opposite deformities from toe to heel in the very common flat foot and the very common cable varus foot. You need to be aware of each segment deformity and don't just concentrate on what's easiest for your eye to see. Which brings us to this principle. The reason that the foot is so complex, besides having so many joints and, and so many bones, is that the subtalar joint, which is the foundation of most of the deformities, is unlike any other joint in the body. It's not a ball and socket like the hip or shoulder. It's not a hinge joint like essentially every other joint, the knee, the elbow, the proximal interphalangeal joint. Those are the joints, except for the subtalar joint. And what is the subtalar joint if not a ball and socket, not a hinge joint? Well, I came up with this very, very long term, and it's too much to sort of digest right away, but truthfully, the subtalar joint is an oblique axis, central rotatory joint. I'll try to break that down. I couldn't make it any shorter, and if I made it an acronym, it wouldn't help. But here's the idea. The subtalar joint below the talus, between the talus and the calcaneus and the associated bones, that subtalar under the talus joint has an axis that is not in the frontal plane, not in the coronal plane, and not in the sagittal plane. It's an off axis. That's particularly what makes it challenging. That axis of motion is 23 degrees internally rotated from straight forward, and it's 41 degrees dorsiflexed from perpendicular with the body. That's the axis that it rotates around. And even though it looks a little bit like a ball and socket, it isn't. It's an, a joint on an axis, but the axis is not in a standard orthogonal plane, 23 degrees in and 41 degrees up. So what happens is that when the oh, end, that motion is centered on a hinge, 
The hinge is the talocalcaneal interosseous ligament. So the middle of the subtalar joint. What happens anterior to that point, the interosseous ligament, is opposite to what happens behind it or posterior to it. And when we generally talk about how the subtalar joint moves, we're talking about it looking from the front. Uh, I don't want to get too, too into this right now because I know a lot of you are young trainees, but let me just state that when we talk about motions of the subtalar joint, we're talking about looking at the foot from the front. But if you happen to be looking at the foot from the back and we're talking about what the subtalar joint is doing, the words are going to be opposite because this, the central point of rotation is in the subtalar joint in the talocalcaneal ligament. All right, so let's look at the front. The front is, and that's how we examine the foot from the front, we're in front of the patient. The subtalar joint moves in and out, inward toward the other side, outward away from the body, and it moves up and down. Now I've color coded these because when the foot moves in, it also moves down. So down and in, inversion. And when the foot moves outward, like in a flat foot, flat feet are turned out, it moves out and up. It externally rotates and dorsiflexes. Those are combined motions in the two planes because of this axis and the central point of rotation. So let's, let's make this maybe a little bit more simple. That's hind foot varus. Varus means that one part of the anatomy is angled inward toward the body compared with the next most proximal part. So you can have varus at the knee, genuvarum, where the tibia is angled inward from the femur. We all know that. The subtalar joint assumes a static varus position, the kind of varus you see in the height of a club foot or a cable varus foot, by a motion that's called inversion. Inversion is a plantar flexion down and an internal rotation in. You remember the last slide. When the subtalar joint moves yeah, inward, it moves, in. it moves inward and downward, and that creates inversion. So down and in is inversion motion around the axis of the subtalar joint that results in the static position of hind foot varus. Varus is a position, inversion is a motion. That's valgus, angled out, like genu valgus, hallux valgus, cubitus valgus. It's just a static position, one bone angled outward from the mid point of the midline of the body compared with the next most proximal bone, not with the body, but it's one bone compared to the one just before it. The subtalar joint assumes a valgus static position like we see in flat foot, like we see in skew foot, like we see in vertical talus. It assumes a valgus static position by eversion. Eversion is the motion. It's a term that's only used in the subtalar joint. There's no more, there's no eversion anyplace else in the body. There's no inversion anyplace else in the body except the subtalar joint. So that's why we have to talk about it because we're not familiar with those two terms. No other joint has it. The elbow doesn't, the hip doesn't. So eversion that assumes a valgus static position is dorsiflexion up and external rotation out of the subtalar joint under the talus. Eversion is dorsiflexion and external rotation up and out of the subtalar joint. So there you have the two static positions on top inversion down and in, eversion up and out. Cable varus feet are turned down and they're rotated inward and flat feet are everted, external rotated up and out. So let's continue this idea of understanding the biomechanics. There's a, there's a concept called the acetabulum pedis, the acetabulum of the foot, pedis, the foot. <clears throat> Scarpa, an Italian uh, surgeon in 1818, they weren't called surgeons then, but he was a doctor, uh, did some cadaveric dissections and he took the foot apart on a cadaver and he thought that the subtalar joint was like a hip joint. So he called it this, this structure, this, this socket, this acetabulum, which means the socket of the foot. The acetabulum is the articular surface of the navicular the spring ligament, and the anterior facets of the subtalar joint. And 
that was what he called the acetab lumpidus. I think what he meant, and it was written in Italian, I've tried to read it, interpret it. He thought that we could compare the subtalar joint with the hip. At the hip, there's an acetabulum pelvis. We just call it the acetabulum, but it's the acetabulum of the pelvis. In the foot, there's an acetabulum pedis, the acetabulum of the foot. At the hip, the ball, the femoral head, rotates within the socket. And in the frontal plane, when it rotates in one direction, the ball in the socket, it's adduction. And if it rotates the opposite way, it's abduction. And that's in the coronal frontal plane. At the, in the foot, <clears throat> the socket rotates around the ball. So the hip, the ball rotates in the socket. In the foot, the socket rotates around the ball. And when it goes in that direction, <clears throat> it's inversion. And it goes in the opposite direction, it's eversion. So you can see that these are analogous. They're not exactly the same because the, the hip is a true ball and socket. It can just move in the, the coronal plane the, the subtalar joint, when it moves in toward inversion, it also moves down, which is not in this plane, and it moves out to eversion, it also dorsiflexes up and out. So the out is eversion combined with dorsiflexion, the inversion is in plus plantar flexion, but just take this as a broad strokes. Now, <clears throat> I want to introduce a concept called the CPU, or the calcaneal pedal unit. The primary reason I'm writing a second edition of my book is that I only became aware of this concept about four or five years after I wrote my book. It was conceived of and written in French. And uh, as you may or may not know, the best way to become famous is to read and speak English. It doesn't mean you're the smartest, but English is the universal language. And so if you read, write, speak in English, again, I'm not saying because I, I that's my native language, but, but that's how you get recognized. This is a French concept. In fact, I'm not even sure that, I, that, that the French interpret this concept the way I do. I just know that I, I think what I'm going to present is what they said. And if it isn't, I like the way I interpreted it anyway. And I think it's helpful for you to understand biomechanics by the way I'm going to describe it. <clears throat> the calcaneal pedal unit, the CPU, is the term for all the bones of the foot except the talus. So if you look at this model, you can see that the talus is in gray and all the other bones are white. So all the white bones are the calcaneal pedal unit. We'll just keep say CPU, okay? CPU, all the white bones. The talus is the gray bone. Well, we just spent a few minutes talking about how the subtalar joint works. Well, the subtalar joint, the calcaneus, the, the, the navicular, the cuboid, they're all part of the CPU. The CPU goes from them distally to all the other bones of the foot, but they're all connected. And the subtalar joint is the most proximal part of the CPU. So that's where they separate. That's the acetabulum pedis. So the acetabulum pedis is the absolute, absolute most proximal part of the CPU. It's the, it's the end. It's where the CPU, all those bones, end and articulate with the talus. So why is this important concept? And why am I writing a whole second edition of my book to put it in there? I've written it in an article. I've written it in other places. But I want it to be in, in this resource that that I tried to create for the world in my book. So inversion and eversion take place between the CPU, the acetabulum pedis, and the talus. That's the only really moving joint in the foot. Although I said that there are 26 bones and there are a lot of joints, most of the joints don't move very much. The joint between the, the medial cuneiform and the first metatarsal, it wiggles a little bit. It doesn't really move. The joint between the cuboid and the calcaneus, or between the cuboid and the fifth metatarsal, those joints move a little bit, but they don't really move. The movement is in the subtalar joint between the acetabulum pedis slash CPU and the talus. Okay, so I call inversion and eversion between the CPU and the talus dynamic motion. 
they give you inversion and eversion. All the other foot deformity, oh, and that's where it moves, but that's also where the movement may stop. When inversion gets stuck in varus, it's a deformity. When eversion gets stuck in valgus, it's a deformity. All the other deformities in the foot are with, between the bones and the CPU. The bones that don't move very much, so I call them static deformities. Deformities in the subtail joint are dynamic, but they've lost some motion. Deformities within the CPU are static deformities. So what are they? Well, adduction and abduction of the midfoot. They're deformities between the bones and the CPU. They don't move, they're just stuck, angled inward or outward. And then the forefoot, pronation and supination are static, not movable, not movable deformities within the CPU. Let's take this further. <clears throat> this is a, a model that I put wires and things in so I could create static deformities. If you look in the middle, that's the foot model showing neutral alignment of the foot. The horizontal green line is the transverse plane of the metatarsals. The transverse white line is perpendicular with the vertical axis of the calcaneus, and the calcaneus is the vertical short white line. So this foot is anatomically perfectly normal. The heel is a neutral, all the metatarsals are on the ground. This is an average shaped foot. On the left is supination of the forefoot. You see that the heel hasn't changed. The, the heel is still in neutral. The calcaneus is vertical. When you look at this foot from the back, it looks absolutely anatomically normal. When you look at it from the front, the metatarsals are rotated upward, so the first metatarsal is off the ground. This supination deformity is a rotation within the CPU. The front of the CPU is the metatarsals. The back of the CPU is the calcaneus, not the tails, it's the calcaneus. So supination is a static deformity of the bones within the CPU. And if you look at the right, pronation is a static deformity of the bones within the CPU, where the fifth metatarsal is elevated off the ground, the first is on the ground, and the hind foot is in neutral. And we're gonna come back to that. I just wanted to get to the other two deformities first. Midfoot in the middle is neutral. The calcaneus, the talus, and the, and the forefoot are perfectly aligned. On the left is abduction of the midfoot. It's a static deformity um, of abduction, just like you could have abduction of a, of a shoulder or uh, valgus of a knee. And on the right side is adduction, a static deformity of the bones within the calcaneal pedal unit. No deformity of the hind foot. If you just didn't draw those lines and you looked at the picture on the right, the adduction, you might say, oh, that's a cable varus hind foot. But I created this model such that there's no deformity of the hind foot or midfoot. This is just an angular deformity between the midfoot and the forefoot. Static deformity within the CPU is adduction. Well, let's go back to the, the, uh, the other deformities here. There's neutral. And now I've got on top, looking at it from the front and looking at it from the back. You see, looking at it from the back, we're looking at the calcaneus. The short right line is vertical. Transverse white line means the hind foot is perfectly aligned. And the green line means all the metatarsals are on the ground. And I showed this before, not from behind, but also but from the front. The hind foot is in neutral. Look at those white lines. The hind foot is absolutely perfectly aligned. But the forefoot is supinated within the calcaneal pedal unit. Well, nobody can stand on a neutral heel and the fifth metatarsal. You just can't do it. So if the forefoot develops a rigid, if the rigid supination deformity within the calcaneal pedal unit, what's going to happen is that the first metatarsal <clears throat> will go to ground so that all the metatarsals will be on the ground. And look what happened to the hind foot. The hind foot maintained its relationship with the forefoot. So now the hind foot is in valgus. It's only in valgus 
because the supinated forefoot drove it into valgus. So the transverse white line and the transverse green line have not changed relationships between the two of them. They have the same relationships, but on the left, su supination cannot be sustained because there's nothing in the medial forefoot. The, the hind foot everts to allow all the metatarsals to go to ground. And now we have all the metatarsal heads on the ground and the hind foot is in valgus. And there you can see it from the back. There's the valgus hind foot and all the metatarsals around the ground. So understanding that <clears throat> this deformity called supination is a static deformity within the calcaneopedal unit. When it develops, it affects the hind foot, which follows it where it goes. And so that's a flat foot. And if we look at this model way I created the other way with pronation of the forefoot, we already saw this from the front and then on the picture below, you can see there's pronation of the forefoot, the hind foot's in neutral. Nobody can stand that way. You can't stand on your first metatarsal head with a neutral hind foot. So the fifth metatarsal goes to ground. There, all the metatarsals are on the ground, but look at the white lines. The hind foot is in varus. And when you look at it from the back, all the metatarsals are on the ground because the fifth metatarsal rolled over and dragged the, the back of the CPU into varus. That's a cable varus foot deformity. So this is a beautiful thing. The, the foot wants to have a tripod. It wants to have pressure on the first and fifth metatarsal heads and on the underside of the calcaneus. How it does that is, is a creative thing on, a, on its own part. The problem for us as clinicians is it's when we look at the foot from the front and we see all the metatarsals on the ground, all we think of is when we look at the foot from the back and we see the varus and we see the valgus and we don't recognize the deformity of the forefoot because when you look at this foot on the left, you say, well, all the metatarsal head, the transverse plane is perpendicular with the tibia. But that's not how we define deformities. Deformities are defined as one part in relationship to the next most proximal part. As an analogy, if you have genu valgum, the valgus deformity at the knee is the tibia to the femur, not the tibia to the pelvis, not the tibia to the spine. It's the tibia to the femur. So here, supination or pronation is the forefoot to the hind foot and the hind foot is deformed. It isn't until you uh, neutralize the hind foot that you see the deformity. So if you look at the cable varus on the left, the hind foot's in varus, the metatarsal on the ground. If you look at all the way to the right, there you, there, you, there you say, oh, for sure, the forefoot is pronated because now you're comparing it to the hind foot, not to the tibia, to the hind foot. Um, and a way that you can appreciate the true fact that this is a pronated forefoot is do a Coleman block test. I put a Coleman block, lower right, and there, neutral heel, pronated forefoot. So how does, how does all these words and all these pictures help you? We all know that clubfoot is four deformities by the acronym CAVUS, or, or CAVE, CAVE, CAVUS, adductus, varus, and equinus. Well, CAVUS and adductus are static deformities within the CPU. And there's a, there's a club foot, pronated cavus forefoot, adducted midfoot, varus hindfoot, the yellow arrow. And within the first one to three casts, when doing Ponsetti casting, the cavus is corrected and the adductus are corrected. And then we have a foot that looks like the model in B. There's no deformity left in the CPU. You can see the black vertical line of the calcaneus is perpendicular with the metatarsal head black line. So the cavus and adductus, the two static deformities in the CPU have been corrected. That usually happens in the first one to three casts. Now the only residual deformities are varus of the hind foot and equinus of the ankle. That's why it's so important to do what Ponsetti said. In those casts, correct cavus and adductus first. Then you've got a perfectly aligned CPU. Everything, there's no more deformities in the CPU than take the CPU and evert it up and out around the talus, and finally cut the tendon of Achilles. That, that, so I, I really think that understanding the biomechanics based on the CPU 
helps make us all better clubfoot um, positions because we understand what we're doing and why we're doing it that way. If we get ahead of ourselves and go right for the varus before we correct the structural deformities within the CPU, it doesn't work. And this is why. So in summary, of the biomechanics, the foot is not a joint. It's many, many joints, some static, some flexible. <coughs> Excuse me. And you really need to understand the subtilar joint, the positions, the motions, the non-motions, in order to think about managing it. The acetabulum pedis was a great start. And in 1818, Scarper really was, was brilliant to, to bring to our, everyone's attention the analogy between the hip joint and the subtilar joint but then the French have to give them a lot of credit. I'm not even sure who the French person was who came up with it, but it's in the French literature and the calcaneal pedal unit really helps me and hopefully you understand the biomechanics better so we can better manage the children's foot deformities. And uh, that's the end of my message on biomechanics. Thank you. What I'd like to do now, and then we can get into some questions, is get into the principles of assessment and management based on the biomechanics. <clears throat> well, well, first, are there any are there any questions that might want to... Um... Yeah, I don't think there's anything in the chat, please, but... Uh... Yeah, uh, anything about uh, the Professor, yeah. yes, I, I have a question. Uh, you said that there is a deformity in the CPU. So which deformity starts first? It's a hind foot leads to the forefoot deformity or it's a forefoot deformity which leads to hind foot deformity? That's a great question. And it's different for varus and valgus. In the caval varus foot deformity, the forefoot pronation develops before the hind foot inversion. And we know that because when we do the Coleman block test, the, the, the forefoot um, is rigidly pronated while the hind foot remains flexible and corrects. When we, when we do the Coleman block test early on in the cable varus foot deformity, we, we uh, allow the forefoot to pronate off the block and the varus hind foot corrects to neutral. In time, the hind foot varus becomes rigid, but, it, it, but the forefoot pronation is already rigid. In a flat foot, on the other hand, the valgus develops first. In a flat foot, the hind foot is in valgus and the forefoot is supinated. When one inverts the valgus hind foot in a flat foot with a, for example, a calcaneal lengthening osteotomy, the forefoot pronation, the forefoot, I'm sorry, when you correct the hind foot eversion valgus in a flat foot with a calcaneal lengthening osteotomy, the forefoot supination often corrects itself. In long-standing flat foot deformities, when we correct the valgus everted hind foot with a calcaneal lengthening osteotomy, we uncover that the forefoot supination is rigid and needs to be corrected with an osteotomy of the medial kinea form. So again, to summarize, in a caval varus foot, the pronation of the forefoot is the leading deformity and the hind foot varus follows. In a flat foot, the eversion deformity is primary and structural forefoot supination is secondary. Okay. Is One that, more is question. That... Uh, since, yeah. uh, from Vidya Sagar about Q foot, he's asking whether it's an aberration from your static uh, theory, CPU theory, or is it an uh, uh, aberration, or is it is it a consequence of bad casting or is, how, do, how do you deal with skew, skew foot with the CPU co concept? So skew foot, skew foot is an idiopathic deformity as well as an iatrogenic deformity. But there are, um, in, 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 in my experience, most of the skew feet that I've um, seen and managed have been idiopathic. They're just a variation on the theme of flat foot. So a flat foot and a skew foot have valgus eversion of the hind foot. A flat foot has no deformity between the midfoot and the forefoot except for supination. A skew foot has supination and adduction between the midfoot and the forefoot. 
So the difference between skew foot and forefoot is what's happening in the midfoot, forefoot. Same hind foot, in a flat foot, only supination of the forefoot. In a skew foot, supination and adduction of the midfoot. Do you have any uh, tips like for atypical club feet, like you showed for the actual club feet, the, the concept about atypical club feet, do you cast them differently or do you have any tips on, on casting atypical club feet? Well, that's actually beyond the, the scope of this talk. This one? Okay. Uh, I, I, I could, um, I, I think I Fine, might be If it's beyond, then we'll take answer. it out of the system. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You can go on to your next. Okay, great. I lost my. Uh, how do I get my pictures of you guys? I, I can't find them. Anyway, uh, I'll come back to it. So let's talk about assessment and management principles. A named foot deformity, by named foot deformity, I mean club foot. That's got a name. A flat foot has a name. Cabus foot has a name. They all have names. But the name deformity can exist in children that are very different. And the management of the same named deformity often varies considerably based on what else is going on in the child. So let's just take flat foot, for example, even though it's primarily just a different foot shape, but a symptomatic flat foot may be seen in an otherwise normal child. Oops, let me go back here. In otherwise normal child or one with cerebral palsy or uh, one with myelomeningocele or poliomyelitis. Well, I have the wrong talk here. Anyway, I'll get through it. Um, but children with ligament laxity syndromes or stiffness syndromes, they all may have the same foot deformity but based on their underlying condition, they may be managed very differently. I'm gonna just check one thing here because I think I pulled up. Okay. All right, we'll be good. This is great. So we might manage them very differently. When we evaluate the child, the child's foot, we start with evaluating the child. It's not necessary to have a gait lab, but you need to watch the child walk if they can or not walk if they can't. But when you're evaluating the foot, evaluating the child, how strong are they? Can they do a squat? Can the child hop on one foot? Can they walk backwards? There you're learning not only about how the foot looks in weight bearing, but you're also seeing how, it, um, how the child controls the foot. And when you're looking at the foot, you're uh, also looking at- Vince, the we are not able to, sorry, sorry to interrupt. We are not able to see your screen. Huh. Oh, oh, I know why. Okay, let me put this back down here and- Yes. Yeah, yeah, I can see you. Okay. So let me delete there. There. Okay, good. This is going to work better. So I'll, I'll just briefly go back saying how the named foot deformity is going to defect, to um, be based on what the child has, normal, spastic, flaccid, stiff, loose chromosome abnormalities. We need to understand the child before we understand the foot. And the gate lab is your eyeballs. Have the child walk toward you, away from you, past you. See how the foot looks when it's being used. And if the child can't walk, that's important information for you to consider as well. <clears throat> They have the child perform. And then if you look here, if you look at the feet in that photo of the child with severe genuvalgum, 
and then you look down at the feet, those feet are in a cable varus position. They don't have cable varus deformity. They're only positioned that way because the severe genu valgus causes the subtail joint to invert to get the feet on the ground. So those are not foot deformities, they're knee deformities. And in that case, correcting genu valgum, whether by guided growth or by osteotomies, would make the legs parallel, would neutralize the subtail joint, and make us recognize that there's not foot deformities there, it was knee deformities that made the feet look deformed. That's why you can't be myopic. You can't just look at the foot without looking at the limbs, without looking at the child. And often the children present because they have pain. Well, you need to know where the pain is when it, to just understand from the child that they have foot pain. And for you to just say, oh, then I get it, it's not appropriate. You need the child to say exactly where the, the pain is. They need to point to it. They, you need to know where they experience the pain. And this is often challenging because sometimes the kids are too young to tell you or they're too shy to tell you, or they're teenagers and they won't tell you. But for whatever reason, you need to get as much information as possible about exactly where the pain is. Otherwise, it's like being a veterinarian. You can't ask a dog where the pain is. And with kids, you often can, and sometimes you're surprised at what they, they can tell you. If you don't ask, you won't know. And then you really going to make some mistakes occasionally because it, there's so many foot differences that can be attributed as a reason for the pain when they're not the reason for the pain. And when you're assessing pain, not only do you want to know exactly where it is, but you want to know how bad it is and when it occurs. It, does it happen only when playing soccer? Does it happen only when wearing certain shoes? And how bad is it on a 1 to 10 scale? Even five-year-olds, even five-year-olds are pretty reliable using the visual analog scale. I don't know if you have these, but we've had these in the clinic. And their faces showing a happy face all the way down to a very sad face. And you ask the child, point to, when you hurt, where, what, do, what does your face look like? What, what do you feel like? Um, it's also important to know, does the pain only occur when active, or does it happen all the time? Is it always there? That tells you a lot about um, the condition. And that leads us to this point, that the signs and symptoms, the pain, when, where, how, must match what you think is going on. So you have to make sure you have enough information before focusing on x-rays. That's why you have to ask the question, because true, the child has foot pain. Okay, we know they have foot pain. That's why the parents brought them in. True, you have an x-ray and it shows a tarsal coalition. Ah, that must be it. But they may be unrelated because at least 80% of tarsal coalitions don't hurt, never hurt, will never hurt. And an even higher percentage of accessory navicular's don't hurt, will never hurt. So if you don't know about the pain pattern and you only focus on what you see on the x-ray, you could get it wrong over 80% of the time. A child could have a tarsal coalition and pain for some completely unrelated reason. Okay, you, you, so you need to make sure that the pain that, you, that the child has, that they tell you about, matches what you find on your physical exam and particularly on your imaging studies. You don't wanna go for the low hanging fruit. You don't want to just get the apples that are easy to, to get off the tree. You want to know what the diagnosis is because you have to be particularly aware of chronic regional pain syndrome, also called reflex symp sympathetic dystrophy. Uh, uh, there are a lot of different terms for chronic regional pain syndrome, but it's pain that doesn't make sense based on musculoskeletal pathology. Uh, I used to see kids sometimes once a month who had pain 24 hours a day for two years, unrelated to what they were doing, not affected at all by non anti-inflammatory medications. When they woke up in the morning, it was a, a three out of 10. And throughout the day, it was a 12 out of 10. Well, nothing, no foot deformity hurts like that. Foot deformities, if they hurt, hurt when their feet are being used. 
and they feel better when the feet are not being used, and they get better with non steroidal anti inflammatory medications. But because chronic regional pain syndrome is something that isn't well understood, but it's become much more common over the last few decades. I used to see one kid every six months, and then last year I used to see one kid every month. And the only way you can make chronic regional pain syndrome worse is by operating on it. And then you own it. But if you recognize that the pain that's being described is so unlike the pain you would expect from a bunion or a tarsal coalition or a flat foot deformity, that the pain doesn't match what you see clinically and radiographically, you send them to the pain clinic and the pain clinic cures them. If you operate on them, you make them worse. So when we're assessing foot deformities, we need to think about the segments. There's a forefoot segment, a midfoot segment, hindfoot segment, and we've talked about those under biomechanics. And the ankle is also, although it's not part of the foot, it can also be deformed in varus or valgus, plantar flexed or dorsal flexed. And when we're evaluating the foot, we've got to evaluating the child. Now we're getting down to evaluating the foot. We need to make a list, especially in the beginning when you're starting out in assessing and managing foot deformities in children, write down, just have a, a list. It says forefoot, what are the deformities? Midfoot, hindfoot, ankle. And then once we know what the static deformities are, we need to assess motion. And the hardest motion to assess is subtalar joint. The most moving part of the foot, but the hardest to assess. I'd say that in a child, the hardest, most unreliable physical exam is of DDH. So when you're evaluating an infant for hip stability or instability, that hip exam is very challenging. For you trainees who have never felt an unstable hip, you don't know what you're trying to feel. When you feel your first one, then you just try to memorize it. Remember what it's like for that hip to go in and out with the Ortolani and Barlow maneuver. But it's a very challenging, very technical exam. Well, the subtalar joint is the second hardest exam in the uh, baby musculoskeletal system because the ankle can cheat and give apparent subtalar motion when the subtalar joint isn't moving. Show parts joints, the telonavicular and calcaneal cuboid joint can sometimes give false motion that appears to be subtalar when it isn't subtalar. So mastering evaluation of the subtalar joint especially in tiny little feet, is something that you need to perfect and practice. In fact, I recommend that fellows and residents try to do subtalar joint evaluation under mini fluoroscopy in the OR. You know, don't, don't radiate your hands too much, but just see under fluoroscopy, is the subtalar joint really moving or are you rocking the ankle joint or are you rocking show parts joints? And you need to assess subtalar motion by dorsiflexing the ankle. Once the talus is dorsiflexed in the mortise, it cannot rock anymore. Then when you invert and evert the hind foot, the only motion is in the subtalar joint. Whereas if the ankle is plantar flexed, the narrow part of the talus is in the mortise and inversion and eversion may be subtalar, but it could also be rocking of the talus in the ankle. So dorsiflex the ankle, and then with your hand on the hind foot, invert and evert. So the too much more words, that I'm not gonna explain any better here, but assessing subtalar motion is something you need to practice. And I think mini fluoroscopy for a few seconds or a minute in the OR is a great thing to do. The next most important thing to do is to assess heel cord, Flexibility. Heel cord is a term for either the entire tendo Achilles, triceps suri, or the gastrocnemius. Many foot shape differences only hurt because of a contracture of the heel cord. Flat foot, for example, everyone has flat feet. At least 25% of adults and probably 90% of babies have flat feet. But what converts a flexible, normal, painless flat foot into a painful flat foot deformity is a tight heel cord. Well, the tightness may be in the gastrocnemius alone, 
where the soleus has full flexibility, <clears throat> or the contracture may be in the entire tendo Achilles, the tricep suri. And if one is going to operate on a symptomatic painful foot deformity with a tight heel cord, you're going to need to lengthen the tight heel cord. But if the soleus is not contracted and only the gastrocnemius is contracted, you only lengthen the gastrocnemius. If the entire tricep suri is contracted, you lengthen the entire tendo Achilles. So differentiating them is important. And that's done with the silver scale test. This, again, is best done, I think, for when you're practicing under mini fluoroscopy. You flex the knee to relax the gastrocnemius because the gastrocnemius starts above the knee. You invert the subtalar joint to neutral so that you don't get any false dorsiflexion through the subtalar joint. In the first talk, I said the subtalar joint inverts and everts. The subtalar joint goes down and in and up and out. Well, the up and out, uh, the up and down are dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So the only way to know if the ankle joint is dorsiflexing or plantar flexing is by putting the subtalar joint in neutral and holding it there. Do not let the subtalar joint invert or evert dorsiflex or plantar flex. By holding the subtalar joint in neutral, then any dorsiflexion that occurs is in the ankle joint. Do that with the knee flexed first, eliminate the gastrocnemius, then with the neutral subtalar joint, dorsiflex the ankle, and see if the soleus is contracted. Extend the knee, maintaining subtalar neutral, and dorsiflex the ankle. So in this case, you can see subtalar neutral, knee flexed, the ankle dorsiflexes. The soleus is not contracted. Extend the knee, <coughs> excuse me, extend the knee, maintain subtalar neutral, try to dorsiflex the ankle, and it doesn't go. So in this case, the gastrocnemius is contracted, the soleus is not, and if one were going to do a heel cord lengthening, it would be a strayer or bulpius of the gastrocnemius. Whereas if the ankle did not dorsiflex with the knee flexed, then the soleus is also contracted. In this case, the heel cord would be lengthened as a full tendo Achilles lengthening. So assessing subtalar motion and assessing contracture of the heel cord are two very important uh, a physical exam test that you need to perfect. And I think a few seconds under mini fluoroscopy will help you. Hello. Oh, not moving. Oh, there we go. Let me back up. So we can't ignore the ankle joint. The ankle joint is not, excuse <coughs> me, Part of the foot, but it's right nearby. So that's a valgus ankle. You can see the little toe on the, on the right side of that posterior view. Well, when you look at this, so there are two places for ankle valgus deform for hind foot valgus deformity. One is the ankle, and one is the subtalar joint. You can see in the picture where I've got my fingers under the malleoli. The bottom of the medial and the bottom of the lateral malleolus in this foot are at the same transverse level. Well, if you look down at your ankle right now, you'll see that your lateral malleolus is closer to the ground and farther from your knee than your medial malleolus. But in this case, the malleoli are at the same transverse level. The yellow lines that I drew there are the tips of the medial and lateral malleolus. Well, it's known that the angle between the, the um, distal tibia articular surface and the line between the malleoli is about 15 degrees different. So if the bottom of the malleoli is the yellow line, then that an those ankles are in about 15 degrees of valgus. Before you get the x-ray, you know that because you examined and saw that the malleoli are at the same level. But there are the x-rays. Just confirming the malleoli are at the same level. So the 15 degrees of valgus from there says that these joints are in valgus alignment. This hind foot valgus is an ankle. It's not a flat foot. Well, the valgus ankle exists in kids with myelomeningitis, heel, poliomyelitis, some club feet, and in every newborn, all, all of us were born with valgus ankle deformities. But by age three to four, except in the conditions I mentioned there, by age three to four, the valgus ankle has spontaneously gone to neutral. <clears throat> 
that is perpendicular. So here, this clinical photo looks just like the other one, the August hindfoot uh, scars because previously operated, but here the lateral malleolus is closer to the ground than the medial malleolus, which tells me before I get the x-ray that the ankle joint is going to be more neutral because the malleoli are in the right relationships. And there it is. That's what I have. That's what you have, unless you have one of those conditions. But, but this is the typical alignment, lateral malleolus closer to the ground, farther from the knee than the medial malleolus. The ankle is perpendicular to the tibia. It's what we see in normal kids after age three or four. So it says that in this foot, compared with the one on the left, this is a flat foot. It's got the algus version of the subtalar joint. This one, if symptomatic, would be treated with a flat foot reconstruction, whereas on the left, if it was symptomatic, it would be treated by correcting ankle deformity, by guided growth in the young child, or by supramalleolar valgus correcting osteotomy in the older child. As we're evaluating uh, the foot, we also need to look at how the skin is reacting to the deformity. In flat feet with tight Achilles tendons, the midfoot is forced to the ground because of the tight tendo Achilles, and callus formation develops in the medial midfoot. Again, it says, this is not just a flat foot, but the tight tendo Achilles is forcing the midfoot to the ground, creating that stress, callus formation, redness, pain. This is a child with insensate feet from myelomeningocele, and here you can see neurotrophic ulcers. The child doesn't report pain because they're insensate. But by your physical exam, you look at the skin and say, I know you're not telling me there's pain, but I see the sores, I smell the infection. Um, this is part of our job as, as physicians to get as much information as we can, ask, look, touch, look at the images, but also look at the, at the child. And particularly in cable varus foot deformity. So cable varus foot deformity is never idiopathic. It's always due to muscle imbalance because of an underlying neuromuscular condition. So we need to just be able to do these simple physical exam tests. How strong is eversion? How strong is inversion? In a cable varus foot, eversion is uh, power is weak. Check for sensation. Check for reflexes. It takes just a few minutes to get this information, and it's vital. Don't depend on a neurologist to do this. This is not rocket science. Just do these simple things that you see here, muscle strength, sensation, reflexes, and you'll have a lot more information to make a diagnosis. When evaluating the foot, not just on the exam table, the child has to stand up. This foot that's hanging off the edge of the exam table looks like it's a flat foot, right? And then when the child stands up, it is really flat. I mean, it reminds me of a flat foot on the bottom of the ocean with two eyes on one side. This is a real flat foot. And so although you might think the, the foot on the left could possibly be symptomatic, when you look at the one on the right, and then you do the silver scale test and see how tight that tendo Achilles is, you say, okay, now I better understand why you're symptomatic. When we're managing foot deformities, <clears throat> we need to recognize that the decision to operate is more important than the type of surgery you perform. It's not that you perform the best of whatever operation there, that you perform, the best operation ever performed. If you do it for the wrong reason, it doesn't matter. What matters is making the decision whether you should operate and then doing the best operation possible. So the decision to operate is based on the known natural history. Almost all babies are flat-footed. I mentioned it earlier. Almost all of them are flat-footed. But the arch develops in most by early teenage years. 25% or so, 20 to 25% of adolescents and adults are flat-footed. And unless they have a Achilles tendon, it's just another foot shape. A flat arch, a low arch, is just like being short-statured. It's not a disease. It's a difference. It's just a difference. So we need to know the natural history. Some healthcare providers uh, operate on all flat feet, but there's no indication for that for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is that a lot of those flat feet in three-year-olds are going to be arched feet in 13-year-olds. The next thing to consider 
it, before deciding to operate is how does the foot deformity respond to non-operative management? When I was a resident in orthopedics in the early 1980s, um, we operated on about 100% of club foot deformities. We did casting for months. It was not Ponsetti casting, it was kite casting, and it didn't work. So we casted and casted and casted. And finally, by about age six months, we did circumferential releases on everybody. Well, with the Ponsetti method, you can achieve the same deformity correction, but without all the morbidity of surgery and avoid surgery. Now we know that, and now we perform the Ponsetti method, and we rarely, if ever, operate on club feet. So the decision to operate is first, can I achieve my goals of deformity correction without surgery? In a case like club foot, the answer is yes, and then only reserve surgery for the 1% of, of uh, club feet that don't respond to non-operative treatment. And the final decision to operate on a deformity is based on risks and complications. Hallux valgus is ubiquitous. Everybody's got it. My wife has it. My, my daughter has it. They don't hurt. My wife and daughter are beautiful people. They, they are athletic. They're, they're wonderful. And they have bunions. So what? The surgery for bunions has so many reported risks and complications that one would not want to consider surgery for cosmesis because the treatment could be worse than the condition itself. So these are all the things to consider when you're deciding whether you're going to operate. Another thing to consider is that one cannot unoperate on anybody. And foot deformities and malformations are never lethal. Nobody ever died of a tarsal coalition. So non-operative treatment has to be exhausted before going to surgery in certain of these conditions, accessory and navicular. So a short period of time of non-sports or taking anti-inflammatories or changing shoes, way, trying to avoid surgery in these somewhat symptomatic conditions is the way to go. And if one cannot stop the pain, then surgery should be performed. But don't go right to surgery because you have a symptomatic coalition or hallux valgus or accessory navicular or some other conditions. Try non-operative management. First, change sports from soccer or cricket to swimming or some or cycling or some other activity. Try to stop the pain because stopping the pain should eliminate the surgery and its complications. So many foot deformities. And now, Darren, I'm a little over an hour, and I heard I had about an hour, hour in a little bit. Can I keep going or what's the deal? Yeah, we can continue. No problem. Okay. Yeah. So in so many uh, foot deformities, like cable varus, like skew foot, there are many procedures, each individual standalone procedure, that are combined to treat the deformity. So in cable varus, <clears throat> there may be two osteotomies, soft tissue release, tendon transfer, sometimes uh, tenotomy of long toe flexors. There may be five to seven standalone individual procedures that are combined for that particular child's foot deformity reconstruction. Sometimes you go to surgery knowing exactly what you're going to do. And in some cases, you do certain things knowing that you're going to get to a point where you have to make a decision to do or not do something. And then you keep going and you come to another point that you can only make the decision intraoperatively at another fork in the road. Do you go right or do you go left? So the best thing to do is write down a list. Make a list before you go into surgery on complex foot reconstruction. What are each of the segmental deformities? Forefoot, midfoot, hindfoot, ankle. What are the deformities? What are the flexibilities? What are the strengths and weaknesses of the muscles? When am I going to, I'll start here, I'll go to the next one. When am I going to come to a decision point and what will my decision have to be? So write all these things down. In time, you won't need to write them down. It doesn't hurt to write them down until you retire, but write them all down. What is there? And then what do I plan to do? And when do I get to the decision points? And what are the decisions I'll need to, to make? Because you don't want to be dis dis surprised in the middle of the operation. You have your list. You're following your list. You have it written on a piece of paper or you have it written on the wall. 
know what you're going to do and what you need to decide intraoperatively. Don't be surprised. <clears throat> you want to be prepared like, like a Boy Scout or Girl Scout. You want to be prepared by having the list of things you're going to do or might need to do. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so so I, I think that that's really critical. If you're going to do one specific procedure, you don't need to do it. But once you're talking about two or three or, or certainly more procedures within an operation, make your list. Now, the next principle is to correct the deformities at the site of deformity, unless the only option is orthodesis. But what do I mean by at the site of deformity? So in a flat foot, E version is up and out. That, that's the deformity of the hind foot, it's E version. Well, the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy is a, is a procedure that corrects all components of subtail joint E version at the site of deformity. It corrects everything. The posterior calcaneus displacement osteotomy has been used by some people to correct flat foot, but the posterior calcaneus displacement osteotomy only corrects calcaneal valgus. It has no effect whatsoever on the malalignment at the tail and navicular joint. It doesn't raise the arch. It doesn't put the navicular in front of the tails. It only makes a flat-footed person look, when we're looking at the flat-footed person from the back, it makes the hind foot valgus look neutral. But it doesn't address the pathology. And the pathology is the front of the subtalar joint, at the tail and navicular joint. So the posterior calcaneus osteotomy only corrects hind foot valgus, but doesn't adjust the pathology unless you do a lot of other things. But the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy addresses E version of the subtail joint. It aligns the tail and navicular joint. It elevates the arch. It corrects hind foot valgus. So the site of deformity is addressed by a calcaneal lengthening osteotomy rather than posterior calcaneus displacement osteotomy for, for, for flat foot. For cable varus foot, Again, some people lead with a posterior calcaneus lateral displacement osteotomy. And a posterior calcaneus lateral displacement osteotomy will move the heel over so that when you look at a person with a cable varus foot, the hind foot varus will not be apparent, but it will not do anything to adjust the pathology at the tail and navicular joint, the front of the subtalar joint. In a cable varus foot, a plantar medial soft tissue release aligns the tail and navicular joint. It everts the inverted subtail joint, and it simultaneously corrects the hind foot varus. So it does everything that uh, cannot be done with a simple posterior calcaneal osteotomy. Correcting cable varus foot deformity at the site of deformity, then for cable varus foot, is a plantar medial soft tissue release, not leading with the calcaneal osteotomy. Cavus, the high arch, <clears throat> and metatarsus adductus are midfoot deformities. I'm not talking about in cable varus, I'm not talking about varus. Now I'm talking about cavus. The high arch is cavus, metatarsus adductus. They're both midfoot deformities. And the deformities are in the medial cuneiform. Historically, cavus, midfoot cavus, and adductus were treated with metatarsal osteotomies but the metatarsals are not where the deformity is. The deformity is in the midfoot. It's the medial cuneiform may be extending over to the cuboid. So in correcting those deformities, do medial cuneiform osteotomy, not first metatarsal. The deformity is in the medial cuneiform. You need to identify where the deformities are and then correct the deformities at the site of deformity. So there was a bank robber in the United States in the early part of the 20th century. And he was very successful. And he was asked when they finally caught him, they said, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. So when you're correcting deformities, go where the money is. Where's the deformity? Go where the money is. We need to preserve subtalar joint motion. The subtalar joint is the shock absorber of the body. I you keep mentioning the subtalar joint because it's just critical to everything we do in managing foot deformities in children. The subtalar joint was designed as the shock absorber. Okay? And if you eliminate subtalar motion by subtalar fusion, triple arthrodesis, the ankle joint cannot do what the subtalar joint did or does. So with subtalar fusions, <clears throat> the ankle joint 
takes stress and becomes degenerative. Years following subtalar and triple arthrodesis, the ankle joint develops arthritis, the treatment for which is arthrodesis. Maybe arthroplasty, but maybe arthrodesis. So if you have a fused subtalar joint and you have a fused ankle joint, you basically have no motion whatsoever. One thing better than a, a pan tailor arthrodesis is an amputation because the prosthesis has motion, has flexibility, and, and provides function. So, so don't fuse the subtail joint in children um, or adolescents. Save that for adults. And some of you may have heard or maybe use technology to treat foot deformities in children, so-called arthroresis. And I don't want to get too deep into this because it's a whole topic on its own. But some healthcare providers, particularly podiatrists in the United States, and I think some orthopedic surgeons in Europe, uh, improve the shape of flat feet with the arthroresis uh, subtalar implant. The reported complication rate with arthroresis is between three and a half and 30%. And I think that's underreported. So many of these kids with painless, normal, physiologic, flexible flat feet undergo these implants to change the shape and they have post-operative pain that they didn't have before in feet that would probably never have pain in the first place or disability. So these implants do something that's unindicated, create pain that's unnecessary. And even after removing implants in these painful feet that were only painful because of the implants, the pain does not resolve when the implants are removed. So uh, again, whole topic on its own, but I can't condone it. Another principle, and we're getting close to the end, is that there are deformities and there are muscle imbalances. Uh, many deformities are just deformities, like club foot, like flat foot, except in CP. But cable varus is always is only there, the cable varus foot deformity is only there because of muscle imbalance. If we correct deformities in these situations without balancing the muscles, the deformities will recur. If we balance more muscles and don't correct the deformities, we'll have well-balanced deformities. But what we want is deformity correction and muscle balancing. So that means putting together a lot of procedures under the same anesthetic to address deformity correction and balancing muscles. In tendon transfers, uh, if we're gonna keep the joints moving, then we need to understand tendon transfers. So as Thomas was saying, um, Paul Brand was a, a star at understanding how to move muscles around, to go from the weak side to the strong side and, and to balance. It takes a lot of principles here too to move the proper tendon, to the proper location and insert it at the proper tension. Recognize that the tendon transfers don't correct deformities. That's something done simultaneously, but there's deformity correction and there's tendon transfers. Tendon transfers are based on what is existing and what we anticipate for the future. Because when we operate on a cable various foot in a child with Charcot Marie tooth disease, we don't correct CMT. What do we have? Do we correct the underlying myeloma meningitis cell? We don't correct cerebral palsy. So the underlying condition created the problem, and that problem exists. In some cases, the underlying problem is progressive, like in Charcot Marie Tooth. So we need to transfer tendons based on what exists and what is going to progress in the future, or in the case of CP, not progress in the future. But we need that's why we need to understand what we're treating, what the child has. And tendon transfers are obviously much more challenging if we're preserving joint motion. And I think this is my last slide, that when we're doing three, five, seven procedures under one anesthetic, there's a lot going on. And we need to be done, right? We, wanna, we need to leave the operating room at some point. If we haven't prepared with our list, if we haven't thought through what we're doing, how we're doing it, and if we don't have this plan that I'll get to, then it could take hours to accomplish what I rarely took more than two hours of, of tourniquet time. I was out of the OR with five or six procedures done in, in two hours and 15 minutes, never longer. So what you want to do besides your list is expose and prepare everything before completing anything. Make all your incisions. Make Perform your osteotomies. Release the contracted soft tissues. 
move the tendons that are going to be moved to where they're going to be. Don't finish anything, but just prepare everything. You don't want to, for example, set the tension on a tendon transfer and then do some aggressive exposure and osteotomy. Prepare everything before you finish anything. Then perform and stabilize deformity corrections. Put the bone grafts in. Uh, where you've taken bone out, stabilize the bone. So prepare everything, then perform and stabilize deformity corrections. As you go, now the foot looks like a foot. You've corrected the deformities, and there are going to be incisions that you're not going to need to access anymore. Close them. Just close the incisions you're not going to use anymore. Because the last thing you're going to do is set the proper tension on lengthenings, applications and transfers, and then transfers. But at that point, you, you can't set the soft tissues where they need to be until the foot looks like a foot and has the flexibility of a foot. So you've prepared and exposed everything. You've stabilized the deformities, and you've closed the incisions that you're no longer going to need. The last thing you do is you set the tensions on your tendon transfers or on your lengthened tendons. You can see in that last picture on the lower right, I also I have my stair strips on those incisions that are closed. And the only one open is this is a split tibial anterior tendon transfer being transferred to the perineus tertius. I can do it now because the next thing after I secure this tendon transfer is close the skin, put on the stair strips, and then put on the cast. So that was a lot in an hour and 18 minutes, but th this is critical. I, I talked about a lot of foot deformities as I went, but not as the foot deformity is the most important, as the biomechanics and the assessment and management principles are the most important. So thank you. Thanks. So thank you, Vince. That was a very illuminating and enthralling talk. Every time I listen to it, I learn something. Especially, I keep telling myself the down and up, up and out and the down and in. All those principles are very important. And, and to the younger generation about preparing, assessing, and not operating without thinking. And uh, that you can't undo an operation as absolute terms. I think the younger generation should realize that you should assess deformities very carefully, especially in the foot and ankle before they uh, put an incision. Um, I think there are a few questions. One question I have is about that uh, chemo virus foot. You said medial plantar release. Does that include more than a Steindler's release for your chemo virus foot? More, more medial release? Or what exactly is your medial plantar release? So I, I plan um, next week, I think. Yeah, next week I have the second talk. I plan to talk <clears throat> in a little bit more detail on cable varus. Cable varus is the most complicated foot deformity. It's more complicated than, than club foot. It's more complicated than flat foot, skew foot. It is the most complicated foot deformity to correct. I'll get into that next week. But, but simply stated <clears throat> that a plantar medial release is either what I call superficial or deep. Superficial plantar medial release is re releasing the three origins of the abductor haliasis from the calcaneus and the plantar fascia and the short toe flexors. Those are superficial muscles. So you go through skin, and the next thing you see is the abductor haliasis, which has three origins on the calcaneus. And they're keeping the medial forefoot adjacent to the medial heel. They're on the concavity of the, of the midfoot. So, um, So in the cable varus foot, you have cabus and varus. And the head of the first metatarsal and the calcaneus are held together by the contracted abductor hyacinth. And then on the bottom is the contracted plantar fascia and short toe flexors. Those need to be released to improve cabus and improve abduction. Now, in a subtalar joint in which it doesn't correct with the Coleman block test, it doesn't correct partly because of the superficial contractures, but it also doesn't correct because the tibialis posterior is too tight and the telonavicular joint capsule is too tight. And in those cases, 
after the superficial plantar medial release, if the subtail joint does not evert, the tib post has to be lengthened and the tail and navicular joint capsule has to be released. So basically, a caval varus foot deformity that's inflexible, does not correct with the a block test, is, a, is an acquired club foot. When you do club foot surgery, you release the abductor, you, you release, lengthen the tib post, you open the tail and navicular joint. So a, cl a club foot is a congenital contracture of those structures. A cable varus foot is an acquired contracture of those structures. And I just define superficial as only being the abductor and the plantar structures, and deep as then including beyond that, the tib post and the tail and navicular joint. Dereen, Dereen, I don't know if Dereen has... Uh, yeah, there are two, two questions, uh, which are... The first question is about the vertical talus. Uh, whether the vertical talus is uh, dynamic and static. So the question is like, where is the deformity, vertical talus? It's in the CPU or where is the deformity? So the, the uh, good question. Congenital vertical talus... <clears throat> is an exaggerated eversion dislocation of the subtalar joint. So I think of this um, eversion of the subtalar joint as a spectrum, starting simply as a physiologic flexible flat foot with eversion up and out. The next more serious condition would be the flexible flat foot with eversion and a tight Achilles tendon. Beyond that is congenital oblique talus. And I, I really can't get into that because you and I, Darren, are going to define that. But, but actually, the next thing would be congenital vertical talus. And the congenital vertical talus is eversion. The subtalar joint, the CPU, is everted, so much so that it dislocated. And dislocation means that there's loss of our contact of articular cartilage. In the simple flat foot, eversion creates uh, up and out, but there's always contact uh, maintained between the navicular and the head of the talus. It's rotated, but, it, there's, but there's contact maintained, just like abduction of the hip. If you abduct the hip, there's contact between the articular surface of the femoral head and the acetabulum. In a flat foot, there's motion rotation, but there's always contact. In a vertical talus, it's like a dislocated hip. In a dislocated hip, the articular cartilage of the femoral head no longer touches the contact of the acetabulum. In a vertical talus, the articular cartilage of the navicular does not touch the articular cartilage of the head of the talus. It's dislocated. But it, so it's the most extreme eversion to the point of dislocation, just like a dislocated hip is the extreme of abduction of the hip to the point of dislocation. Good. The second question, again, a very important question. Do you suggest to keep the subtalar joint in a neutral position or lock it in a full pronation to assess the ankle joint dorsiflexion? I think that's related to what you showed in the silver skull test. Yeah. Again, and that, that's a, an excellent question. Um, I, I usually, and I try to catch myself because I always talk about invert the subtalar joint to neutral when doing the silver skull test. And that's because most of the time we're doing the silver skull test is when we're assessing heel contracture in flat foot. But in a caval varus foot, you, it's already too inverted. So in a caval varus foot, what you need to do is to evert it to neutral. So in a flat foot everted, you invert to neutral. In a cable varus foot, you evert to neutral. The point is you want the subtail joint to be neutral and not to be allowed to move. You need to just lock it in the most neutral position possible, in from the out position, out from the in position. But you need it to lock it to neutral. Once you have confirmed with your hand on the subtail joint that it cannot move, then any dorsiflexion or plantar flexion is the ankle joint. So again, very good question. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Mosca. And I am sure that we are going to continue the same discussion and particularly understanding of the foot deformity in the next uh, lecture. So uh, those who are, uh, Here, you will be- Let me yeah. just say one more thing. 
I yeah. think the topic I chose for next time was individual foot deformities. What I'd like to spend at least a half hour on next time, or maybe 20 minutes, is radiographic assessment of the foot. Because how to understand how to obtain x-rays of the foot, how to use x-rays is, is really, really key. Just like the talks today, foundational. <laughs> so I'll, I'll spend the, probably the first half of next time talking about radiographic assessment of foot deformities, and then the second half talking about some foot deformities. Okay, perfect. So again, uh, we will be meeting on 25th of July, same time at 8.30 Indian PM. And probably uh, lecture may last more than one hour uh, up to so like 75 to 90 minutes. So be prepared with that. Thank you okay. very much once again you. for sh sharing your vast experience with us. Thank, Thank you. you. See you, my friends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See you. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.